Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt God's name forever, for the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. God's mercies never come to an end, and they are new every morning. Great is our God's faithfulness. Let us lift up our hands to the God from which comes our help. Let us praise our God from whom all blessings flow. For this is the day that our God has made and we rejoice in it. For this is the day that we have never seen before and it is marvelous. It is marvelous in our eyes. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord. Our God is good. Good afternoon, Alfred Street. Good day, sisters and brothers, saints and sinners. I bring you greetings in the name of our Lord, our God. I greet you in the name of Jesus, who is the Christ, who covers us as a loving parent, a protective parent, the one who is the very substance of our first and last breath, the very ground of our being. Thank you to my pastor, the Reverend Dr. Howard John Wesley, for this privilege and this opportunity I don't know about you, but I think he should be America's pastor. Because we need somebody to contradict this foolishness and this blasphemy. I'm surprised the thing didn't combust in the man's hand, but anyway. And thank you to the Reverend Dr. Judy Frenchers Williams, always supportive, always so gracious. Thank you. I am grateful. I'm grateful. And thank you to all of you for making your way to the sanctuary and for those of you who are online, who've logged on to participate in our midday meditation this Monday, Thursday. If we have any first time visitors here, either here or online, we welcome you, we're glad you're here. If you're on the chat, give us a shout out where you're, where you're viewing from. Won't you please stand as you're able and join us in the first two verses of our congregational hymn, Near the Cross. Love. 
that you remain standing for our responsive reading. Congregation will respond uh, with the text that's in bold. Our reading comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 53, verses 1 through 6. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Stray, we turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of our soul. As is our custom, we ask that you remain standing for the reading of the Holy Scripture. Our scripture lesson today comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22, verses 14 through 23. I'll be reading from the contemporary English version of the Bible. When the time came for Jesus and the apostles to eat, he said to them, I have very much wanted to eat this Passover meal with you before I suffer. I tell you, I will not eat another Passover meal until it is finally eaten in God's kingdom. Jesus took a cup of wine in his hands and gave thanks to God. Then he told the apostles, take this wine and share it with each other. I tell you that I will not drink any more wine until God's kingdom comes. Jesus took some bread in his hands and gave thanks for it. He broke the bread and handed it to his apostles. Then he said, this is my body, which is given for you. Eat this as a way of remembering me. After the meal, he took another cup of wine in his hands. Then he said, this is my blood. It is poured out for you. And with it, God makes his new agreement. The one who will betray me is here at the table with me. The son of man will die in the way that has been decided for him, but it will be terrible for the one who betrays him. Then the apostles started arguing about who would ever do such a thing. Verse 3 of our hymn of consecration.
glory Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my Savior, my God, my strength, and my Redeemer. May your people be benefit. So, good afternoon again. My assignment is to facilitate a meditation. And many of you have been in attendance here or online this entire week, so bear with me. But I wanted to comment that I think that people sometimes misunderstand what is meant by the word meditation. And I sometimes get the impression that some may limit its meaning to the idea of one type of meditative practice common in some Eastern traditions involving sitting cross-legged on a cushion, often with a um, thrown in for good measure. But that's not the type of meditation we have in mind for today. We have in mind today, what we have in mind today is more akin to the biblical word, the biblical Greek word for meditation, melataho, which means to care for, to attend to carefully, to practice as well as the Hebrew word for meditation, haka, which in gen, don't you wish sometimes that Dr. Judy could just do a voiceover when you're doing these, (laughs) these biblical languages? Anyway, which engenders the concept of murmur or imagine or to moan, which is very much in the African American tradition. So what we want you to experience here today and to leave with as you either go back out into the world or for those of you who've had pedicures when you come downstairs for foot washing, (laughs) is an experience of care, attention, and engagement with the Holy Spirit as you are led. Today I wanna offer for your consideration a meditation on the topic. Be careful who you invite to dinner. Be careful who you invite to dinner. As you know, the scripture just read in your hearing is Brother Luke's account of the evening of Jesus' last supper, supper with the apostles. So one of the things that stood out to me as I was reading this, these passages was Luke's rendition offers references to the passage of time. There are intervals throughout that passage. Now, by my count, there are at least 13 indicators of time intervals, depending on how you read it. Number one, when the time came for Jesus and the apostles to eat. Then he said to them, I have very much wanted to eat this Passover meal with you before I suffer. I tell you, I will not eat another Passover meal until. Jesus goes on to say, then he told the apostles, take this wine and share it with each other. I tell you that I will not drink any more wine until. Eat this as a way of remembering me. After the meal, he took another cup. Then he said, This is my blood. The one who will betray me. The son of man will die. But it will be terrible for the one who betrays me. Then the apostles start arguing. 
So in each of these intervals, everyone in that room had an opportunity to comfort Jesus, to express concern for Jesus, to hold Jesus, to pray for Jesus, to at least commiserate with Jesus about his plight, even at least to maybe think up a plot to try to thwart what seemed inevitable. But you know what they did? They start arguing. They started arguing. What do you do with that? I know this doesn't apply to anybody here, but it definitely applies to me. I have been on the receiving end of it and I've been guilty of it. Have you ever called a friend for support or help or counsel and before you know it, the conversation has done a 180 degree turn and become completely about the person you called? Have you ever talked to or heard about a victim of some type of abuse? And they were asked, well, why didn't you ever say anything? Now, we won't talk about victim blaming and shaming, but often the response is, I did, but nobody would listen or pay attention. Or God forbid, somebody attempts or completes a suicide, and you look back and you can see all those indicators over time that they were suffering. And what do we do? We start trying to figure out who's to blame for what, what somebody did or didn't do, what somebody did or didn't say. Basically, we start arguing or trying to defend or justify. Meanwhile, the person who should be the subject of our concern suffers alone or they're dead. So apart from the commonly understood importance of what our scripture lesson represents this Thursday, I want you to consider thinking about these few ideas that I respectfully submit to you. You're going to get out of here really early. Don't invite just any and everybody to your table to eat, especially on a special occasion. Be careful how much wine you serve at dinner. And don't let the dinner go on so long that your guests get to drink so much wine that they get stupid and start to argue. And three, this is what I hope is the good news for you because it's the good news for me. You and I always have time to decide how we're going to be a good dinner guest. We have time before, we have time during, and after we sup at the Lord's table to eat and drink at the banquet of God's goodness. We have time to pause, to pay attention, to pray, to care for, to hold, to comfort, to attend to, to murmur, to imagine, to moan, to honor the sacrifice made for us and the unearned blessings through grace that we are the beneficiaries of. That's all I got. Amen. Amen. Let's take a moment.
Lord Jesus, we pray for those who suffer. Help us to remember to pay attention, to be kind, less self-absorbed and less blaming. Make us good dinner guests. Remind us to keep our focus on you and the sacrifices that you made for us on the cross. Jesus with us. Jesus before us. Jesus behind us. Jesus in us. Jesus beneath us. Jesus above us. Jesus on our right and Jesus on our left. Jesus when we lie down. Jesus when we sit down. Jesus, when we arise. Jesus, in the heart of all who think of us. Jesus, in the mouth of all who speak of us. Jesus, in every eye that sees us. Jesus, in every ear that hears us. Let's close now with verse four. standing for our benediction. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you and those you love. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Go now in the grace of God and may the grace of God go with you. Amen. Amen.